Okay, um, welcome to those of you who have joined. We're at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and kick things off. My name is Shannon, and I run marketing for River Logic. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today, Eyes for Optimization at McKee Foods, Deploying Solutions That Matter. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. Thank you, Brett. So, uh, first of all, this webinar will be recorded and everyone will receive a link to the live recording tomorrow. And the slides are also available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. We're going to hold off on questions until the end. So, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, just go ahead and submit those via the chat function in the control panel and we'll cover those toward the end. And if for some reason we don't get to your question, we'll make sure to follow up via email. And you can find the contact information for Brett and Aaron, our two presenters today, in the slide deck that's in the handout section. And I'd also like to mention that we have our um, ebook on prescriptive analytics that we wrote as a company if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about prescriptive analytics. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce our presenters. With us today, we have Brett Sennett, Advanced Analytics Manager at McKee Foods, and Aaron Berg, VP of Professional Services at River Logic, and they're going to talk a little bit about the power and accessibility of prescriptive analytics and talk about the journeys between McKee Foods and River Logic over the last um, decade or so. So with that, Brett, I will pass it over to you. Well, great, thank you, Shannon. And I uh, really appreciate everyone taking time out of your work day to join us today. Uh, as, as Shannon mentioned, we're here to talk about the power and accessibility of um, prescriptive analytics or optimization modeling and share two real world, real world journeys that McKee Foods has been on and some specific uh, use cases and uh, what we were able to take away from that journey. But first, I wanted to introduce myself uh, a bit more and let Aaron do the same. Um, I have a background in uh, computer science uh, along with some, some business background and done a variety of IS roles over the years, help desk server support, web development, uh, even though I currently work in supply chain. So I've had this uh, really interesting history of <clears throat> understanding what computers and computer technology can do and also spent a lot of my time understanding other people's problems with technology and how to best help solve their problems. Um, in my MBA program, I really enjoyed economic modeling, advanced managerial accounting. Um, sound, sounds like I, I guess I got a lot out of the program, didn't enjoy it, enjoy it for other reasons, but, uh, but I enjoyed the academics of the program and found all these uh, disciplines really interesting. Um, but it was also that same time that I got introduced to River Logic suite of tools and found that uh, it incorporated a lot of these different elements about uh, advanced finance and economic modeling and managerial accounting and just really fell into um, uh, really liking and using the tool for, for business problems. I've uh, been with McKee Foods now for 13 years uh, and had over a decade designing and implementing analytical solutions, whether that's optimization modeling, uh, just graphical data reporting, data preparation, a little bit dabbling into predictive analytics. So. Um, really enjoy working with data, really enjoy um, understanding, kind of framing problems and problem solving. Uh, a little bit about me, I have my two boys there on screen uh, along with my wife and I. I caught a little bit of flack because the first picture in that was my uh, car. I joke that that's my midlife crisis car and it's a red Prius. So if you have any questions about my devotion to optimization modeling, there it is that, that my midlife crisis car was a Prius. Uh, for no good reason, because I live about 10 minutes away from work in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. About McKee Foods, um, McKee Foods is a was founded in 1934 by Ruth and O.D. McKee. Our products include uh, sweet baked goods, uh, snacks, and cereals. We're most known for our Little Debbie snacks. You may know oatmeal cream pies or um, Swiss rolls, some about granola, and a recent acquisition was the Drake's Cakes. Uh, we're privately uh, owned, family owned, third generation family led, with annual sales of roughly 1.4 billion. And our primary market is the continental US uh, with additions of some uh, online distribution and limited export and international. Aaron, uh, introduce yourself. 
Sure, thanks, Brett. Um, so, Brett, I'm just I'm thrilled you're here today. Uh, we've we've worked with McKee for a long time. I'll I'll tell you a little bit about myself and introduce River Logic. Um, uh, so, my background is I have a really cool job. I get to get up every day and work with companies using technology that's optimization based, that has strong and deep roots in, as you were saying, Brett, um, you know, economic modeling, microeconomics, that sort of thing, um, and get a real thrill out of using this technology that RiverLogic as a company has been evolving over uh, the last two decades, really, uh, initially as a project tool and now really as a full, a full platform for uh, um, prescriptive analytics um, and help use that technology to solve real business problems. And, you know, Brett, that you're going to walk us through a couple of the business problems that you've applied to is just a fantastic thing for us. Um, and hopefully you guys will get a lot of, out of it. Um, you see a little bit of other, a few other things about me. You can tell I like to fish. Um, I don't know if there's an optimization problem in fishing. Uh, if any of you can think of one, just let me know. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, incorporate it. So maybe a little bit about River Logic. Uh, if we flip the slide forward, we've got uh, River Logic was formed in around 2000. Um, we started with the real goal to leverage uh, uh, techniques like optimization, optimization specifically, to solve lots and lots of different business problems. Um, what we saw in the market were people using, for example, optimization to solve very specific problems. But we say, gosh, you know. What if we could solve all kinds of business problems, whether it's supply chain or whether it's service industries or other sorts of business problems where lots of complicated interdependent decisions were occurring? And, um, and that's really where we started. So we have a platform uh, and a very unique sort of visual modeling system to, to capture business problems. And we're very <laughs> deep, as, as Brett mentioned, in financial uh, modeling. So, you know, not just, um, you know, how do I get my products to market for the lowest cost, but really cool stuff like what about uh, how do I make the most profit? How do I optimize my cash flow? Other sorts of things that you could incorporate into these business problems. Um, over the years, we've done at RiverLogic hundreds of optimization projects. And what that means is that we've been exposed to lots of different ways to use optimization in business. Those Those hundreds of projects were uh, primarily all different projects, different industries, different use cases, that sort of thing. Um, and over the years, we've gotten pretty good at it, we think, and, and you guys will be the judge of that, see some of the things that Brett shows. Um, but really, what you know, one of the takeaways from it is that we're able to uh, create value quickly, uh, really in months rather than year-long um, year, year long implementations. And the foundation of that is what is now being called in the marketplace prescriptive analytics. Prescriptive analytics, and this is a quote from, from Gartner, um, is the use of logic and math, so formal techniques, to find the best course of action. Um, prescriptive analytics gives you a decision. In other words, it tells you, hey, you should do it this way, you'll get the best result, rather than just a report that shows, here's what your uh, you know, sales figures have been, here's what our forecast is for the future. Um, and that's, a, that's actually really important, that, that idea of having a system that can look through all the complicated ways you could run your business, whether it's how you, you're, you're going to hear about how you, you know, how you fill up a truck or how you make decisions on which products should be sold from which uh, distribution centers, things like that, where there's lots of different ways to do it and it's very hard to know what the best is. Um, and that's really what prescriptive is. It, it's the sort of the only approach that, uh, you know, that outputs a decision rather than just some data. Um, and prescriptive analytics for us is all powered by optimization, uh, mathematical, precise optimization that looks through all the possibilities and suggests the best answer. Um, so with that, perhaps, uh, 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 Brett, you'll, you'll show us some of these best answers and, and techniques that you've, uh, you've leveraged in your business. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. Um, just a, a one last piece to kind of help set some context. I really want to give you a bit of a taste and flavor for McKee Foods, and I think it's captured in two slogans that we have for the company. They're up here on the screen. The first is, we bake and the world smiles. And this is a very easy to understand, uh, outward facing slogan that, that talks about how we think and feel about our customers. We want 
everything that we touch, everything we do, we're making that product for the customer and the consumer. When, when the consumer gets it, they open it up and they smile. We want to bring smiles to consumers, but we also want to go back to the supply chain and bring smiles to all the partners we work with back to uh, ingredient sourcing. We bake and the world smiles. Pretty straightforward. But there's another slogan that's a little more internal in McKee Foods. It was coined by one of our founders, Odie McKee, and it's a, it's a bit of a translation of something from Ben Franklin, but he would say, there's a better way, let's find it. And this is at a time before a lot of the uh, lean and Six Sigma and continuous improvement initiatives and that, that sort of thing. Uh, but from, so from an early time in the company, he was always looking for that next edge, that next improvement. And more than that, he was looking on ways for us to do it together. So I really like that statement um, because I think it aligns very well with optimization modeling. Um, optimization modeling is always finding the best way or the best decision. And as far as bringing people together to do it, it does take the more, the more pieces that you can bring into a modeling solution, uh, the more value you can get out of it. And by bringing those functional pieces in, you're bringing those functional groups together for better shared understanding and working together. So uh, just a little bit more background before I share these journeys. I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, so there's two use cases that we're gonna cover today. The first is uh, on-demand interplant transfer planning, run daily. So it's a very, um, I'll say narrow and tactical solution that takes a look at a lot of variety that happens day to day and how to take that variety and make good operational transfer plans from it. And the second is a very broad model, a cost to serve model run every few years to adapt to geographic changes in dispersal of our customer demand. So just a little bit of an example of some of the versatility that you can do in optimization modeling as long as you have a good, a well-defined problem. Uh, with that first case, um, interplant transfer. So uh, for McKee Foods, we have three manufacturing facilities that have distribution centers co-located with those and an additional standalone distribution center. So four distribution centers nationwide. Of those manufacturing facilities, we do not produce every product at each facility every day or don't have capabilities at all facilities for all products. So we rely on transfers of product between facil manufacturing facilities to distribution centers to, to make sure that we have the right mix of products to send to our customers. And every day when we run our manufacturing, we choose how much to keep locally and how much to send to our various DCs based on current orders, uh, inventory, and future forecasts. Now, the status quo when this kind of problem was brought to me uh, was this little animation here that we have, uh, we start with the shipping case. So the, the colorful cartons that you see in the grocery store um, actually are moved around through the network and our primary unit of measure is a shipping case. Um, when when, when manu manufactured cookies or cakes come off the manufacturing line, one of the first things they do is go into a shipping case and they don't, really don't come out until someone goes into a retail store and goes to put it on the shelf. And a shipping case for us is about the size of a standard size mailbox, if you think of it. So that case gets transformed a little bit. That case gets stacked with a bunch of other cases and becomes a pallet of, of cases um, at the manufacturing facility. That pallet of cases then moves from the end of the manufacturing line to the open door of a trailer and it gets transformed again from a pallet of cases into a wall. Uh, so if you think about this big, long tunnel of that uh, transfer trailer that's going to go from one facility to another, we're taking those and just stacking up big walls as, as much of the space that we can utilize in that trailer. And we do the same thing in reverse when it gets back to the destination distribution center. We put those cases back on the pallet so it can be stored effectively in our, in our bulk inventory system. But as you can see there by the colorful animation, it takes time to do all that. Uh, so what we wanted as the desired product was to keep um, transfers palletized the whole way through. So we, um, we convert the cases to pallets, we then stack those pallets in the trailers and then keep it as a pallet on the other side. Um, so the obvious uh, benefit from there is we remove some waste of motion from actually making that conversion into a wall, but we're also looking at moving things faster through the system so that we complete that whole process more quickly because we complete that whole process more quickly, we have less inventory in the system, and hopefully we're getting uh, products to our customers faster, i.e. more days to enjoy those cakes and cookies. <clears throat> but for all those benefits, there's challenges. Um, 
These first two items on the left here, loss of trailer efficiency and time to work through options and variety in the solution, really speak to the heart of what optimization modeling can benefit. Um, and loss of trailer efficiency, as you might imagine, picture all those walls where people tetrising those, those cases in there, um, there's not a lot of empty space left on the trailer. Whereas if we're bringing in those palletized transfers on, on pallet boards, you're gonna have inches of gap against the side walls, you're gonna have inches of gap between the columns, and uh, hopefully uh, you're not gonna have too much, but you are gonna have some amount of gap between the ceiling and where the top of that, that um, topmost pallet is. So it was a real concern that, okay, we can do this, but and we know we're gonna lose some efficiency, but we can't lose too much. We can't have our costs increase dramatically as a result of this change. Uh, it would be it would too much offset the benefits we would get from reducing inventory in the system. The second piece uh, is that the time to work through the options and the variety in the solution. So as I mentioned, this would run every time we run manufacturing, and um, we'd be looking at let's just say a skew variety of roughly 40 SKUs, but a different 40 each day. And oh by the way, some of them are run and only transfer three pallets, and some transfer 60. And so you have this whole variety of different dimensions of pallets um, that are coming in each day in a way to always blend those in a way that's most efficient. And then both of those speak to really some of the strengths of optimization modeling. Um, certainly some of the challenges were more operational uh, transferring cases instead of pallets. So, you know, we um, may have to prioritize more of the equipment with uh, the use of the forklift trucks and Obviously, if someone's not hand stacking the cases, then, then that, that person may need to be uh, retasked. Um, and lastly, we have the lack of understanding of rules or possibilities of palletized transfers. So um, there were no, there was no rules set. There was no um, guidelines really to say what product can stack on top of one another. Are the cases strong enough? Uh, how much weight could it bear? If, um, if it was too much, what did we do? Um, are there products that shouldn't be stacked on top of one another? So all of this, uh, these rules and this new way of operating, we kind of had to uh, ask what was available, um, suggest maybe some rules, test it, see if it works, check with the experts, and keep kind of iterating on the solution as we develop that understanding uh, of the business problem. Um, as far as what that journey ended up doing and where we ended up getting, we actually had our original model designed in 24 hours. So uh, that just speaks to some of the versatility and the accessibility of the um, of RiverLogic's tool sets in that we could take a good solid business understanding of the problem and translate it into uh, a visual representation in uh, their, their tool and actually prototype that quickly. Um, we, we run this uh, model every day and for each lane, each source, and then destination DC, it takes about 10 seconds to generate a solution. Um, typically, the columns are 98% efficient for height within the, the max trailer height, um, and it's fully embedded in our system. So when, this, when this, these models run, they run problem-free every day, and the results of those models go back to manufacturing to say, hey, when you make those cases, make so many of this configuration and that configuration because the transfer plan depends on it. And then it goes forward to shipping to say, hey, when you load this transfer that has these pallets and things, these are the specific columns and these are the ones that should be on the bottom and these are the ones that should be on the top. So it's, so it's integrated directly into operations. You can see some of our reporting there on the right-hand side where we have the total height used within the trailer at the top for each one of those columns. And you can see that breakdown between its uh, two rows of, of columns within a trailer, the left side and the right side, how much each individual pallet contributes to the total inches in the column. So what, what would allow this to be successful versus just being another uh, science project, another one-off that, that we, we thought was interesting and put it away in the folder? Uh, well, the first thing was executive support. Uh, we had a VP, VP that had been introduced to the tool actually by a professor that I had uh, experienced the tool with in university. Uh, so he understood what the tool could do. Uh, he understood how it related to the business, how it could help actually get us to not just understanding about the business, but actually making decisions faster, uh, but with, with quality. So we had that executive support. 
we had a little bit of a burning platform. There was no other way to do it. Um, some of the programmers had already taken a look at this and, and tried to take some procedural programmatic approaches and not really come up with a robust solution for it. Um, one nice thing about it when talking about the objective, what we were trying to go after, and also the, the data we were using for it, it was really nice that the whole thing was very tactical. So if you ever had any question about what we were doing, you know, maximizing column height or you know the, the cases and how much they weigh and how tall they are, well, go go see a trailer, uh, go down to shipping and get a get a tape measure and measure what that uh, case height is. So it was really nice for this particular um, solution that it was very tactile. And so there, there, it was very clear to people what we were doing and how those different pieces of the solution came together. Um, we solicited incorporated feedback during development and after rollout. So um, there's a lot of things that even the best intention people, you're just not gonna know until you actually get there and start doing things. Um, some of those may involve, uh, certainly involve feedback from shipping where um, some items did not tolerate being stacked on the bottom very well. So we were able to put rule sets in to not allow those particular options to be presented um, to the model. So then the model could not select those uh, and then was able to use the remaining variety to pick, still be, pick good solutions. And so again, we maintain the solution we still have buy-in from everybody, and we actually have increased buy-in because we've incorporated that feedback. Um, lastly, it was, I think it was very important that we were able to troubleshoot and explain the model visually. So the, um, the tools from RiverLogic have the ability to go in, uh, see, see a big, big picture flow, but actually dig in, double click in, and dig into the details in any given data table to say, did I, get, did I have my input data right? Let me validate, okay. Uh, let me see what the solution's doing, and you can do that at kind of a top level, but you can do it at a really fine-grained detail level, and you can get to the through, navigate that detail quickly, visually, easily. So that that was very helpful in getting uh, buy-in and acceptance. <clears throat> so we've had success with this particular journey, but I was going to let Aaron talk, give you a little bit of a broader view about uh, effectiveness of data science deployments. Uh, hey, Aaron, I don't think that your mic is working. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> thank, thanks, Brent. I, I really, um, really appreciate that use case. That's a, just a terrific use case. And one of the things I like about it an awful lot is that it's a very easy use case to understand. As you said, it's very physical. You can walk down to the, to the dock and see how a truck's loaded. Um, and, you know, to go from, hey, I've got this great idea to I have one that is really deployed. It's working. It's, an, you know, it's doing an ongoing uh, job of creating value for your company and insights and that sort of thing. It's really, um, there's a lot sort of beneath that. You know, one of the things that we, we've seen in the marketplace is that, you know, not all of these great ideas, uh, you know, get deployed. Um, you see a statistic there, and I think that's from Gartner, that only 47% of data science projects are fully deployed. Within data science projects are these optimization and these prescriptive, so it's really just a chunk of what's inside there. And, um, you know, we're working hard and our, you know, our industry is working hard to make it easier to have these great ideas and, and create value in an ongoing way. Um, so uh, to give you an idea of what sort of things we've changed, what do we, what do we address to make these things from a technological perspective, uh, you know, reusable and deployable and supportable and long-term value creation. Um, you know, one is to move away from these programming based tools, for, you know, for sure, if you need a programmer to maintain it, um, at least the optimization part, that, that that part of the analytic is very specialized. Um, it, you need to understand a lot about your business and you need to understand a lot about programming. But what if you could take the programming out of it and just have the business user um, be the person who has to understand it? It really empowers them to make the, the solutions work well. Um, the other is, is to go from sort of these one-off projects and ideas to what does it take to support it in an ongoing way. And for us, that means things like running lots of scenarios, what ifs. And I think you'll see that in your, in your, in your second uh, uh, example, um, as well as being able to enable uh, creative folks like you are looking at problems throughout the organization to say, hey, I could see a solution here, I could see a different solution there, a different solution there. 
rather than fo rather than rely on some software company to build you a very specific solution that you can only deploy in a certain way for a certain kind of a problem. Um, and that's one of the things that we focused on as well. And really the ultimate, um, you know, what, what we hope is that the ultimate impact of that is that your investment in thinking about and deploying optimization and prescriptive tools uh, has a higher ROI because it can be deployed and because it's sustainable over a long period of time and creates value. So um, that's really where, where, where we focus. Um, I think it will be fun to hear from you, Brett, what, you, you know, what your other use case is and how different it is from the first one, um, really sort of showing off some of, the, some of what I just was talking about. So why don't you take it away and uh, show us how to rezone. That's great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, deliberately kind of selected use cases that have some, some variety in them. Um, the, as, as we mentioned, we had great success with the transfer planning application, but it was very narrow, kind of tactical in scope. You know, this optimizes this one really specific part of the business, but it's not it's not looking out to really sales or our customers or reaching back into ingredients or anything. It's it's pretty contained. Um, so in contrast, uh, we also had have a solution around rezone, which we we term that. Uh, for the process where every few years we evaluate our customer demand, geography, our internal capabilities and capacities, and select the best primary distribution center to service each customer location to maximize net income. Uh, so uh, we had an existing process for this. We brought modeling to bear. And, you know, after our experience with some of the transfer planning, it really was trying to answer that question with the, with the RiverLogic tools. Um, could we provide a richer answer to this question about who who should be delivering to our customers than we have in the past. Um, so the the state before kind of bringing in the optimization modeling, uh, we're really looking to to um, move I guess move with customer demand. So we're really considering capacities, looking at shipping and transportation capacities understanding where we're at in terms of hitting a maximum capacity, but also maybe some load balancing across the organization. Um, so uh, that had been the focus. And so what that meant was what was missing were things like, well, what does that change do for interplant transfers? Or how does that geography match with where the product's actually sourced from? We're only kind of catching the tail end of, uh, of the picture on distribution, really. Um, Second, we had a measure, a primary measure of that process was delivery miles driven, um, but that delivery miles driven wasn't actually translated into cost. Now, uh, there may, you know, you may say that some of the uh, cost of fuel may be small differences between distribution centers, but again, um, maybe there were opportunities there that we, we just didn't see. Uh, but again, the big thing was we didn't have visibility in other cost trade-offs between production capacities, transfers, and then this, this distribution network. Um, really, a, a big piece of this was just having completed that first project successfully around interplane transfer planning, more people, including that VP, had eyes for optimization and saw the existing process and saw it differently now that they knew what could be done with optimization modeling. So again, uh, have challenges in trying to, to bring uh, any kind of change to bear. Um, one, one challenge to the process is defining the demand week, and this goes to the old process or new, but um, we're taking a look at something three to five years that's going to remain in place for three to five years. How do we define customer demand in the model in a way that's representative and doesn't have any maybe uh, exceptional items or exceptional activity that we wouldn't expect to generally recur week to week? Um, Second, we had an interaction with other systems. So even though the EO models can be self-contained, optimization models are self-contained uh, and can bring data in and out easily, um, we had a process where data would leave the EO model, be processed by another system, and then ultimately change some of the inputs for another uh, model. So we have this interaction with other systems to manage. The model size and detail, uh, for us, this was one of the largest, more complicated models that we had pursued. Uh, so just to give you an idea of scale, uh, for our customers to fully represent all the options within customer demand, 
we had like one and a half to two million rows of data just to represent all the different options about how those customers could be serviced. Um, not to mention any of the other uh, data about data plant transfers and actual manufacturing capabilities and that sort of thing. Those two points kind of lead into the data management. That again, I think uh, for the most part, it's very uh, straightforward to get data in and out of the modeling tool. But because we had data passing to, I'll say, less nimble systems uh, to get data back and forth and, and through, um, data management was something that was a challenge. Um, and lastly, for something like Reason Model, again, that contrast, we owned really the process for interplant transfer planning. We owned the success or failure of uh, whether those transfers were um, efficient or not. But for something like Reason, there was a lot of stakeholder groups we were accountable to. So. Uh, transportation, uh, shipping being two primary ones, but then the manufacturing planning as well, or um, manufacturing, that changes to the, the delivery zones could have secondary impacts to how much product of which items will run at uh, each facility, which could impact um, staffing plans. So we had a lot of stakeholder groups to consider, not just for what reporting would come out of it, but involvement during the process to make sure that we involved any constraints specific to those groups um, in the modeling process. So as far as getting through the solution for Rezone, uh, we now have a, a modeling solution that uses variable costs of manufacturing, transfer, and shipping costs uh, and capabilities to maximize net income. So the point is, how do we best align ourselves with what our customer needs are and, and serve 100% of those needs uh, in the most profitable way possible. Um, and the other way to say that is we're not sub-optimizing towards distribution only. So before we were only seeing a piece of the picture, now we can examine those trade-offs between delivering from one DC to a customer versus another, the proportion of uh, uh, manufactured goods that would be sourced at that DC that's sending it versus those that would require to come in transfer, but not just for a single customer, for all of our customers at the same time so that we can know that we're getting the best global uh, solution for, for company profitability. Um, another change that happened from this is that we have uh, 100 times faster evaluation of scenarios. So previously, if we had an idea about how we wanted to, to take a look at this uh, rezone solution, we'd have an idea, we'd, we'd put it through the paces and really we'd get a result about a, about a week later to say, this is what it would look like. Um, and so by putting the resources into the optimization modeling and the surrounding solution, uh, we were able to get through um, solutions 100 times faster to get through basically 20 of those types of results in a 24 hour period. And that's a little bit of there, what you're seeing in the animation on the right, that you're seeing the solutions and the sequential solutions about which distribution centers should serve which customers and you see early on, it looks a bit like, like confetti, like a hot mess. But then as, the, as it goes on, it's actually still changing right now. Um, those uh, customer locations start lining up with more common sense uh, distribution center alignments. You can see by the strong patterning there in color for those, for those DCs. So what were the success factors for the, for the rezone model? Um, Again, I think a big part of it was uh, executive support and, and more, even more so than the original model, really having the eyes for optimization. So he, he just saw what we were doing, our existing business process differently because of the exposure to, the, to what optimization modeling could do. Um, it helped that we had a success under our belt, so we had an accessible, proven optimization tool and technology. Um, we have good data sources for validated data about operations. So within planning and order fulfillment, we have some data warehousing that goes on that says, you know, we can go and look at the detail to say how well did we do yesterday, but we're also trying to develop good metrics to say how well do we do generally or over the last six months? What's our, um, what's our variable cost of ingredients? What would we estimate as a reliable uh, run rate in cases per minute or cases per shift? as far as what to expect for our manufacturing line. So all this supporting data we already had in place. So the gap be uh, between the data we had and the data that we would need to drive this kind of model was, was next to nothing. 
we had clarity about the goal. Um, the nice thing was the rezone process and its in its prior state had taken place for for many many years. So the uh, we had a lot of people there that that knew what we were doing, had clarity about the goal, and could, could quick, quickly tell us when uh, the results of the process were not meeting the goal. And lastly, uh, I do men did mention a lot of data passing between different business systems. It wasn't a kind of an isolated uh, modeling solution. So we did have strong IS support to meet the needs of those other business systems and get data from EO to those systems and, and from those systems back into uh, RiverLogic's product. So it's really easy for me to sit back and talk about these and give, give you some success stories in, in bullet point form. But uh, I will say it is the journey that matters and, and going through the, the work of troubleshooting the model, having the conversations with folks that really brings a lot of value in addition to getting, getting an operational solution. So um, what some of that is new and improved business understanding, uh, data corrected or new data created. So um, you know, I've heard that you really know your data quality when you really use it, and EO requires you to really use it. EO will make decisions on it. If it makes bad decisions because you have bad data, I mean, that's that's a natural kind of thing that could happen. Um, second thing is uh, we find unidentified constraints as we try to map the business process to, to a solution and find out where it doesn't work. So we did have a situation for that pallet stacking example where um, we found that we had an issue with mast heights for forklifts. So if any of you have been uh, in the warehouse before, you may, you may see where I'm headed with this, but um, we, we found a situation that there, there's a, a vertical piece to the forklift trailers that maybe if you had a, a box or something on a forklift, it might slide back into almost like a wall uh, there uh, to prevent it from sliding into the driver. Uh, so as you were loading things on a trailer, if you had a really short pallet and it was at the top of a column on a trailer and they were trying to put that on top in the trailer, um, we run into a problem where the mast height or the mast of the forklift would actually go through the roof of the trailer. So it wasn't something that was immediately obvious to us that hadn't worked in shipping, that weren't actually doing the work of putting the pallets on, but it was something that became immediately apparent when we tried to execute the plan. Uh, so we were able to get that information back to understand how we would translate that requirement into how we uh, stack the columns and put that in as a constraint as far as what the model is allowed to do. Um, and again, because of all the, the flexibility and versatility that was remaining in the model, still got great solutions and able to, to keep our trailers whole free, uh, skylight free, um, and still keep our solution. Um, I wanted to mention the inclusion of more experts and stakeholders because while I mentioned again that the modeling improves as you include more opportunities, more decisions, more scope of the model, what that usually means is you're including other functional groups and by bringing everybody to the table to talk about it together, we're developing a much deeper shared understanding as a business about our business processes and how they relate um, than we are just sub-optimizing and doing these things as spot solutions here and there. So. Um, really gotten a lot of benefit from that, um, just improved shared understanding. One of my favorite things to talk about is uh, taking a look at model results and whether you have an insight or an error. So uh, as you look at these, we have a mathematical optimization engine taking your business problem as you defined it and spitting back a, a set of decisions to, to get the most released out of what you want, most profitable usually. Um, but those decisions may vary greatly from what you do today. And when they do, it can sometimes beg the question, was it an insight or was it an error? Uh, so we, we had a situation where we had some seasonal products that were really uh, popular and they happened to exceed our available line time for the same time frame that they're sold in. So one of the options we have for our products is for certain ones, we can freeze them and run them earlier than the demand and then bring them out of the freezer when that demand's higher and kind of time shift that manufacturing. Um, so because this particular product was seasonal and because it was really high volume, it was obvious, well, that's the problem. Uh, we're going to go freeze that item and then bring it out later when demand is high for it. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Very straightforward, common sense way to deal with it. Well, when we implemented our model, we saw that the model was choosing to freeze different items. And 
it really didn't make a lot of sense to people that have been involved with the business a long time. So it got us begging the question, is this an insight or is it an error? And as we went to look at it a little deeper, uh, we found that it was an insight. We found that uh, the model, uh, based on the good understanding that we gave it of the business, actually found uh, less expensive ways to time shift that manufacturing and provide the needed capacity for that seasonal product uh, than we had previously done in our business practices of freezing seasonal products. So it's that kind of journey and exploration uh, that can add value, again, beyond, uh, beyond the direct optimization solution itself. Lastly, I think completed models beg new questions and curiosity. So I kind of mentioned in the reason solution that we, we um, definitely benefited from the success we had in the transfer planning model. So you get a successful model and you say, oh, that's really neat. It considers all this stuff, but what if it considered this one more thing? Or what if it, uh, what if we, instead of bringing this in as a uh, constraint, what if we let the model decide this part? What, how would that benefit the model? How would that benefit the solution in the business? Um, another piece is even though the primary result of the model is that set of decisions that gets you that, say, most profitability, um, the other thing it does is identify all those places where you're constrained. So you can go in there and take a look at all your constraints and maybe maybe it's just that you're constrained for sales and you need to, to go out there and be able to sell more whatever it is you're selling. Um, but maybe it's, a, maybe it's a bottleneck for interplant transfers or maybe it's a bottleneck for a certain kind of manufacturing capacity. So you can not only see that in the model, but get a valuation of how much that uh, missing capacity is worth and have new conversations about, I'm doing this model because I'm trying to get the best plan, but the best plan is hindered by this. And now side discussions can happen about how we make sure we have the right capacity to move that bottleneck and get more out of the business. Um, but again, lastly, I know I've mentioned it a few times, it's a theme here for the presentation today. Everybody involved gets those eyes for optimization. They, they see it firsthand how you identify a problem that would lend itself to optimization, the steps you go through in working through refining, making sure you have your data valid, and then um, how you get to successfully implementing that in the business and just how, um, I guess, fulfilling, for lack of a better word, it is to, to see uh, the results of all that put into action on a regular basis. So uh, with that, we, we've talked a little bit about the transfer planning and reason model. We're going to get ongoing value out of that. Um, we have some other models in place today as well. Uh, we've actually extended the reason model for greenfield analysis. So if you can think about those uh, three manufacturing facilities and four distribution centers, the idea is, well, what if we added a distribution center in another city? Or what if we added a manufacturing facility, a distribution center in another city? It's probably going to affect the zoning for those other for our existing facilities, um, but of course that means having the estimated data about interplant transfer costs and delivery costs to our customers and capacities. Um, but a, a great valuable tool to have if you're considering uh, changing dramatically changing your network. Um, lastly, we have the contingency model, which I kept trying to think about how to. Um, really capture this, and I would say it's a little bit of formal firefighting. So if we use that, it, it plans out an optimization model for a week, uh, considering supply and demand, and is really for those situations where supply or demand change dramatically. So if we had, say, a competitor leave the marketplace where demand for our products went up substantially in a very short amount of time, or if we had um, a situation where one of our lines or facilities was unavailable uh, for for a short to medium time range, um, then we could bring in the contingency model, say the world has, has turned, things are crazy right now, let's represent that in an optimization model, see the most we can get out of our system, and then uh, make some quick decisions about how we're gonna react to, to the world changing. Um, so these are some, some of the current solutions we have, gotten a lot of great value out of um, <coughs> RiverLogic's tools and really, um, the only constraint is having that eye for optimization and, and using your imagination to see what you can do with it. So I want to transition to Aaron a little bit about um, getting value out of using your imagination with, with these prescriptive tools. Sure. Thank, thanks, Brad. I, I, that's just, those, those stories are fantastic. And I know everybody who's listening is sort of imagining 
people running around at McKee with their eyes for optimization, looking for more business problems to solve and more you know, uh, complex, interesting things and insights to get as the journey uh, goes forward. So I, what I thought I'd do is at this point, you know, after, after folks have heard what you have gone through, is, is just sort of maybe um, uh, you know, open up uh, some, some thinking and some imagination for the folks listening about where you might be able to apply prescriptive analytics in really non-traditional ways. Um, so I'll, I'll throw a few examples out there and let, uh, let everybody think about it and sort of give you a challenge to come up with some of your own. Um, you know, one of the one of the most interesting ones to me is uh, is complex manufacturing constraints. So many different industries have unique and unusual manufacturing constraints that aren't shared by other industries. Whether it's uh, you know some complex manufacturing constraint somewhere, or there's a way that production happens that uses byproducts or something that uh, really does drive an optimization question. Um, there there are, you know definitely some some things you could do there. Um, we're seeing non-traditional supply chain all the time, uh, e-commerce, direct-to-customer shipping. You know, how do I optimize? You know, having maybe it's warehouses that serve both, or should the warehouses be dedicated? Things like that. Um, another idea that that's come up actually, you know, when we talk to customers over and over, are these green initiatives. Um, and one of the things about green initiatives is that just about everybody comes at a green initiative thinking that it's going to cost them money in order to seem green or be green in the marketplace. Um, so the optimization questions tend to be, or tend to at least start as ones that balance what's the cost of my green initiative versus what's the best way for me to do it at the lowest cost. And I think in a couple of cases, we've even seen it sort of flip where the green initiative actually drives higher profitability. So there's a lot of interesting sort of uh, potential there. Uh, another one is reverse logistics. I mean, uh, this goes along maybe with the green stuff. Um, you know, you were, you know, when customers return things. I don't know if you've uh, bought things online, and some some companies have really great ways for you to get things back, and there's an optimization problems in there, perhaps. Um, and then one thing that we didn't mention, uh, you know, in your story so far, uh, Brett. Although I think over the years we've we've talked about it and you've even used optimization models for, is on the raw material side. Um, whether you're whether you're coming up with contracts with vendors or uh, things like that, there's there's potential for um, for optimization problems to pop out there. So anyway, my my challenge to the audience is: Are there interesting uh, non-traditional supply chain optimization problems out there that you that you might want to solve? Um, and then maybe uh, to Brett and to McKee. What's next for you? What's the next great imagination, uh, imaginative idea that you've got coming up? Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. So, yeah, I, I reviewed some of the um, solutions we, are, we currently have in place, but our eyes on what's next. And we're certainly, again, uh, looking at using our imagination for, for new use cases. Uh, one is ship-based transfer planning, which isn't the... the Reasons for that aren't that different from the original. You know, the idea is to move inventory through the system faster and to leverage the power of optimization modeling to be able to move it faster while still moving it efficiently and still having those efficient uh, columns for interplant transfers. So, looking at maybe doing what we do better, um, medium range planning. So, taking a look at the year or two time horizon with weekly supply and demand and taking optimization modeling and using that as a way to uh, get those two sides of the coin to match up and meet, uh, not just meet customer demands, but all of our other uh, business requirements as well. And lastly, uh, taking a look at production scheduling. So when you get into the near term and we've got the, the uh, demands on our manufacturing for the day or for the next couple of days, uh, to take an EO model to say, well, what sequence of production should I run to minimize uh, change over time, which we're not producing cases during that time, while still meeting all my customer service levels. Um, so we've got a, we, we have a lot of successes behind us. We've got a journey, more journeys ahead of us. Um, but if I could leave everybody with one thing today, it would be that um, with optimization modeling, we can lean into complexity and the use of more information to make better decisions more quickly. And that has everything to do with the power and accessibility of the RiverLogic tool set um, to, to allow us to turn those ideas and imagination into real solutions more quickly. 
Well said. Uh, with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over to Shannon if we have time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for that. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first of which I think, Brett, um, you can address this one. So what characterizes a good optimization tool versus one that um, is not going to get you that, that value as quickly? Sure. So for, for us, uh, a good optimization tool has been one where um, it is less black box. So again, that idea that you can visually see, see the whole model, see how all those pieces relate to one another but also visually, uh, I'll say click in, but visually uh, investigate the model to see, validate that I've got all my input data correct and valid, uh, validate and understand um, how different decisions are being made within different parts of the model to kind of uh, see the forest and the trees easily. And it's not, it doesn't require uh, detailed programming knowledge or things to do that, that a business user can go and do that, um, not just design, but inspection of the model very easily. Yeah, fantastic. And, and for the um, people listening, we have a big section on this in our prescriptive analytics ebook as well, if you want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, so the next question, Aaron, this is probably for you. We've got someone who wants to hear a few more examples of non-traditional optimization solutions within supply chain specifically. Sure. I think um, one of the things that we have been uh, um, had fun with over the years is is in in all of the different projects that we've done the the vast variety of different kinds of use cases that have come up. Um, we did uh, several years ago some really interesting supply chain stuff around hospitals um, and and treating or sort of connecting up the uh, not only the physical supply in a hospital but with the patients and treating the patients as if they were um, you know, being manufactured to being healthy, if, if you can sort of think about that in your head. Um, other, other interesting use cases, including um, uh, optimizing cash. Uh, so actual money, the green, you know, green money that comes out of an ATM, you can imagine banks have to move this around and get it to the right places so someone can take it out. And then when they deposit or buy something and the store brings it to the, you know, all the cash back to the bank, all that money needs to be moved around and that supply chain uh both the return and the distribution of it back out to the uh um you know the, the businesses and the atms and the banks uh is fairly complex and it's a great supply chain problem that's very very non-traditional so those are two examples that uh um you know might get your imagination going a little bit around what you might be able to do Awesome, thanks for that. I, I think one more that comes to mind as well that's pretty common is um, product mix and labor modeling, um, just to throw that one in there. So we're gonna do one more question um, in, let's see, this person wants to know if there are companies or individuals that are particularly prime for optimization initiatives. So this is a question that we get a lot as well here at River Logic. So you know, the uh, concept of if as a company, how can I tell if I'm really ready for optimization? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll uh, take Aaron, a little bit. Yeah, I'll take a, that a little bit and then we'll ask Brett for, for his insight because he's, he's really been there. I, I would say one of the things that, that uh, we found is that, you know, if you have some data about your business, you're ready. You, the data doesn't have to be perfect. Your business processes don't have to be perfect. You can start with projects and then move into supporting business processes of the type that Brett sort of outlined. Um, but one of the nice things about optimization, and Brett alluded to this during his talk, is that if you build a model and you run an optimization and you don't like the results, your first uh, uh, task is to decide whether those results are an error or an insight. If they're an insight, you've learned something about your business, even if your data is bad. If they're an error, you've learned what data you should probably be focusing on to make good. So either way, you've created value through this prescriptive analytics process uh, in a way that if you just stand still and wait until everything else is perfect in your business before you move forward, uh, you can't do. So I would suggest, you know, dive right in, uh, start the process and get the value as quickly as you can right off the top. Um, Brad, anything to add to that? Yeah, it's it's so hard to say uh, to to say where it's limited because we all 
we all use some process to make decisions every day. And so to the degree that any of those can be where you can bring data to bear and formalize that decision process, a tool like this uh, could, could help with that process. But um, if I, to, to try to be a little bit more narrow, you know, if I think back to the, the transfer planning model, we had a really well-defined problem and we knew, we knew we had solid data to solve it. And we knew we didn't have enough hours in the day to do it um, manually, to do it with fingers on the keyboard. So um, uh, we have, our VP is fond of saying, it's just math when we get into some, some complexity stuff with software design or problems. But really, it's just math. And if something is going to cut through that math, it's probably going to be optimization model. That's a great example. Chat? Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you, guys. I think um, at, at this point, we'll, we'll close it out for everyone. And um, I do want to let attendees know that McKee Foods has generally, uh, excuse me, generously um, decided to send one attendee a, a little box of goodies from them for completing a survey that we have at the end of this webinar. Brett and Aaron will be presenting this at a supply chain conference in September. So we would love any feedback on ways that we can improve this presentation. And one person out of the survey respondents will receive that uh, box of McKee Foods goodies. So that survey is going to pop up at the end of this webinar. And we want to thank everyone for joining and um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brett.